So we've spent a bunch of time analyzing the Schwarzschild metric after initially deriving the metric by solving the vacuum Einstein field equations. In this video, we're going to go one step further in our analysis and talk about one of the most important predictions made by the Schwarzschild metric, that of a black hole. Specifically in this video, we'll talk about the non-rotating spherically symmetric black hole or the Schwarzschild black hole and introduce that in this video. But before we talk about the Schwarzschild black hole, let's discuss the time component of the metric by first recalling the Schwarzschild metric. You probably know at this stage that the line element for a spherically symmetric space-time geometry is the following. I'll call this equation 1. Note that r sub s is the Schwarzschild radius, which is related to the mass m of the spherical object as follows. g is the universal gravitational constant, and c is the speed of light in vacuum. Recall also that t is the time coordinate, r is the radial coordinate, theta is the angle from the positive x-axis, and phi is the angle from the positive z-axis. Now, let's go back to special relativity. Recall that the proper time tau, taken by a particle that travels along a time-like path in our four-dimensional space-time hypersurface, recall that this proper time is directly related to the length or distance traveled by the particle according to the following equation. S here is the space-time distance traveled by the particle along our particular path. It's a space-time distance, not just a spatial distance. Keep that in mind. If instead my particle traveled an infinitesimally small space-time distance ds with a corresponding infinitesimal proper time interval d tau, then the relationship between d tau and ds would just be the following, very similar to our non-infinitesimal relationship. Of course, these two equations are both from my special relativity series. This should hopefully just be a refresher for you. It's essentially the definition of proper time. If I now rearrange this infinitesimal equation in terms of ds squared, I'll get ds squared equals negative c squared d tau squared, and I'll call this equation 2. I'll now substitute equation 2 into equation 1 to get an expression for the proper time interval d tau in my Schwarzschild geometry. Okay, now let's say that I have an observer who is sitting at a radial coordinate r and with a fixed position in my Schwarzschild geometry. Since the position of my observer is fixed, the dr, d theta, and d phi are all zero. This means that the proper time experienced by my fixed observer is related to dt by the following. I'll call this equation 3. Now dt is just used to represent the coordinate time. The coordinate time doesn't explicitly have a physical meaning like proper time does. It just has units of time, but we can transform it around by scaling it up, down, whatever. However, in this particular coordinate system, I'll show you that dt can have a physical meaning, but this doesn't mean it's always a meaningful quantity. To do this, we'll analyze this equation by looking at a particular scenario. In this scenario, I'll suppose that my observer is really far away from my mass m, so their r coordinate approaches infinity. This means that as r approaches infinity, rs over r approaches zero, and so d tau is approximately equal to the coordinate time differential dt. So with this little analysis, we can infer that in this specific coordinate system, the differential in the time coordinate dt represents the proper time measured by an observer at infinity. I'm going to label the proper time measured at infinity as tau sub infinity. I'll then replace the d tau by d tau sub r in equation 3 to represent the proper time measured at a radial coordinate r. If I then make these substitutions into equation 3, this is what I'll get. I'll take the square root of both sides to get this, and then I'll integrate both sides. When I perform the integration and then get rid of my integration constant, here's what I'll get. And then if I isolate my tau infinity, I'll get tau sub r over the square root of 1 minus rs over r. And this equation, which I'll call equation 4, is my equation for gravitational time dilation in Schwarzschild geometry. It goes without saying that this equation is really only valid for values of r that are greater than r sub s. Otherwise, we'd be taking the square root of a negative number and would run into problems. But stay patient, because I'll talk about situations where r is less than r sub s later on in this video. So let's do a quick numerical example involving gravitational time dilation. Let's say I have a really small-sized planet such that I have an observer outside the planet who's actually at 4 over 3 times the Schwarzschild radius r sub s. Suppose that this observer measures 10 years on their clock, so tau sub r is 10 years. As a result, another observer at infinity will measure the corresponding time on their clock as 20 years. What does this mean? Well, it means that if the observer at 4 over 3 r sub s ages by 10 years, the observer at infinity ages by 20 years. So the far away observer is aging twice as much. 
This is basically gravitational time dilation. Clocks that are deeper in a gravitational field run slower. Let's go back to equation 4 and use it to derive the expression for gravitational redshift in Schwarzschild geometry. Suppose I have an observer fixed in position at a radial coordinate r. The time coordinate is represented on the vertical axis. This observer fires a photon with a wave period of tau sub r, so the time between this crest 1 and this other crest 2. Now suppose that I have another observer who's way far out. This observer receives that fired photon with a wave period of tau sub infinity, so the time between when the two crests of the waves 1 and 2 pass that observer. From equation 4, the relationship between tau infinity and tau sub r is the following. Because of this, we see that the corresponding frequency of the photon measured by the observers is as follows, since the frequency is just the inverse of the period. I'll call this equation 5. Now this equation demonstrates gravitational redshift. A photon fired closer to a massive object has its frequency redshifted or lowered as it moves further from that mass. We found a similar redshift formula in a previous video on general relativity, but that was for the special case of a uniform gravitational field. This is specifically the redshift formula for Schwarzschild geometry. So we've spent quite a bit of this lesson talking about the time component of the Schwarzschild metric. Let's now talk about the spatial component. Let's say that I want to find the space-time distance of the radial path from R1 to R2 in Schwarzschild geometry. Because our path is radial, it only runs in the radial direction, and so d theta and d phi are both zero. We'll also suppose that dt is zero because we only care about the spatial distance here and not the time component. In that case, the expression for ds squared becomes the following. I'll take the square root of both sides and then integrate the right-hand side to find the distance of my radial path from r1 to r2. Now, this integral isn't particularly easy to evaluate. You have to use a couple of variable substitutions involving substituting r as u squared and then replacing u by some hyperbolic cosine function. But when you eventually go through these substitutions and evaluate the integral, this is what you end up with. And I'll leave that for you to do as an exercise. Now, when you apply the limits and actually plug in the r1 and the r2, you'll find that the space-time distance covered by the radial path from r1 to r2 isn't just r2 minus r1, it's more complicated than that. And this is because the space-time surface is curved in the radial direction, so the distance you end up covering along that curved path is actually greater than the simple difference between the radial coordinates. Now, the s that denotes the space-time distance on a radial path from r1 to r2 can also be written as l0, the proper distance from r1 to r2. And when I say proper distance, I mean the spatial separation between two points or two events in Schwarzschild geometry that occur simultaneously, so with dt equals 0, and along the same radial path, so the d theta and d phi are 0. I'll call this equation for my proper distance equation 6. So at this point, we've analyzed the time and radial coordinates pretty thoroughly for our Schwarzschild metric. Let's now move on to the most important question of this video. What's a black hole? Most common sources like Wikipedia and popular dictionaries describe a black hole as a celestial object with gravity so strong that it prevents anything from escaping, even light. In my opinion, this is a fairly broad and somewhat vague definition that lends itself to some misconceptions. It's a good enough definition for lay people, but we're skilled enough at this point to go a bit further than that. So let me describe what a Schwarzschild black hole means by bringing back the Schwarzschild metric in equation 1. I've also copy-pasted the definitions of the Schwarzschild radius and each of the individual coordinates here. Now specifically, equation 1 represents our exterior Schwarzschild geometry, the geometry of space-time outside our spherical mass. If our spherical mass had a physical radius capital R, which was larger than its Schwarzschild radius, we'd have a regular old planet or star, nothing special. An example of this is the Sun. The Sun has a mass of 1.989 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Its corresponding Schwarzschild radius is roughly 3 kilometers, but its physical radius is 6.96 times 10 to the 5 kilometers, so much larger than its Schwarzschild radius. However, if that spherical mass had a radius smaller than its Schwarzschild radius, then our mass would be a black hole, and I'll explain why. So let's suppose our spherical object of mass m is really tiny, such that its radius is smaller than r sub s, its Schwarzschild radius. So for example, let's say I compress my sun into a Schwarzschild black hole with a size that is less than the 3 kilometer Schwarzschild radius, but with the same mass as the original sun. What would happen if I do this? Well, to start off, the planets and asteroids and celestial objects that are stably rotating around the sun would continue to stably rotate in the same path around the sun without issue. 
Why is that? Well, the space-time metric outside our black hole sun is still unchanged, so the properties of the four-dimensional space-time surface, like curvature and everything, those properties are still unchanged. You can see from equation one that the space-time metric doesn't really care about the physical radius of my object of mass m. It really only cares about the mass. That's in the r sub s term. And because of this, particle trajectories outside my sun black hole are unchanged. My particles are still going to follow the same geodesics because I haven't actually changed the properties of the space-time surface outside the Sun black hole. All I've done by compressing the Sun into a black hole is I've expanded the region of space-time over which my exterior Schwarzschild metric in equation 1 is valid. So instead of equation 1 being valid for a radial coordinate starting at 6.96 times 10 to the 5 kilometers, it is now valid starting at a lower value of r. So that's why if my sun became a black hole of equivalent mass, the Earth would still continue in the same elliptical orbit like it always did. The geometry of the space-time region Earth is traveling on will remain the same according to equation 1, and as a result, it's not going to get sucked into the sun just because the sun's now a black hole. The climate's obviously going to change, but Earth's orbit itself will be unchanged. And this is why the conventional definition of a black hole can be a bit misleading. You start thinking that because the gravitational field is so strong, the black hole must have infinite sucking power. But that's actually not quite true. The black hole doesn't have infinite sucking power everywhere, but it does have really strong sucking power close to its boundary. And although this is a good segue to talk about that boundary, this video is getting fairly long, so I'm going to stop here and leave that subject for the next video. Anyway, that should do it for this lesson. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoy the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.